for this end of this series um, under Reconstruction, we're going to hear this story from Acts chapter 16, following from the story we heard last week. One day, when we were on the way to a place for prayer, we met a slave woman. She had a spirit that enabled her to predict the future. She made a lot of money for her owners through fortune telling. She began following Paul and us, shouting, These people are servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation to you. She did this for many days. This annoyed Paul so much that he finally turned and said to the Spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave her. It left her at that very moment. Her owners realized that their hope for making money was gone. They grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the officials in the city center. When her owners approached the legal authorities, they said, These people are causing an uproar in our city. They are Jews who promote customs that we Romans can't accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attacks against Paul and Silas, so the authorities ordered that they be stripped of their clothes and beaten with a rod. When Paul and Silas had been severely beaten, the authorities threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to secure them with great care. When he received these instructions, he threw them into the innermost cell and secured their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. All at once, there was such a violent earthquake that it shook the prison's foundation. The doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer awoke and saw the open doors of the prison, he thought the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted loudly, Don't harm yourself, we're here. The jailer called for some lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He led them outside and asked, Honorable masters, what must I do to be rescued? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your entire household. They spoke the Lord's word to him and everyone else in his house. Right then, in the middle of the night, the jailer welcomed them and washed their wounds. He and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his home and gave them a meal. He was overjoyed because he and everyone in his household had come to believe in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts, our minds. In our eyes, that we might see and know the word you have for us this day. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So it's no accident that, that the majority of this series we've used the book of Acts to reflect. And the reason that, that I've done that is because what we're dealing with is how the church is being portrayed on social media and how people are having to deconstruct their faith because of how the church as a whole is being represented. And yet, Acts gives for us this model of what the early church was like, who we were really called to be, who we were in those first few days, those first few weeks, those first few months, those first few years after Jesus ascended. It's instructive to bring those two in conversation with each other. Sometimes it can be hard. So we're going to look in depth at this incident that I've just read and see what it tells us about who the church is. So, I don't know about y'all, but one of my first questions that I have when I read this story is, why didn't Paul free the slave girl from the beginning? We were, we were in the habit of just walking by, seeing somebody was, you know, possessed by a demon and healing them and setting them free. Why didn't Paul do that? And maybe it was because, honestly, he enjoyed a little bit the fact that this woman who had so much authority and had this reputation was going around and saying, you know, follow these guys. Listen to these guys. They have the way to salvation. They will set you free. You know, they had a free hype woman, right? Going around sharing this word. And it was, there was some advantage in that. But then that raises the question, why do you free her at all? We, we have this idea or sense from, from maybe how we read this and interpret this passage that he just got tired of her talking about it. And he got annoyed. 
But does that make any sense? Would it make any sense for Paul to be annoyed with a woman with a reputation for speaking the truth coming around saying, listen to these guys. They have the way to salvation. That's not like Paul. Paul would celebrate that as long as he could. What if instead Paul was finally annoyed about the woman's situation? He finally realized, I am benefiting off of this woman's enslavement. And I can't take it anymore. And these people are using her, and so am I. So am I. It raises the question, you know, he knows that if he sets her free, he risks threat. He risks prison. He risks interrupting his ability to go around and share the message. But what good is the message if it relies on a woman being enslaved? What good is the message if it means she has to be oppressed? There is no message. And so he sets her free. He takes this bold move to let this vulnerable woman go free, and it costs him and Silas their freedom. They, they get beaten, and they get thrown in jail, where all they have left is their faith. But they still have their faith. And not only do they have their faith, they have a faith that inspires them to sing in prison. They just keep singing to borrow from Dory a little bit. They just keep singing. It doesn't matter that they're in prison. They have this message. They have this good news that's so powerful that it transcends their situation because they know what they have brought to the world. And while they're in prison singing, there's an earthquake, and everyone's chains fall off because that's the kind of faith we have too. The kind of faith that shakes the foundations of the earth and breaks people's chains. What's interesting about this is there's a very easy theological interpretation here. Oh, God made an earthquake happen. God broke my chains loose. I can run. I can go. God has set me free. But is that what Paul and Silas do? No. 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 They do not go. Instead, they ask themselves, who will I hurt if I go free? And they stay put. That's the difference, y'all, between an ethic of privilege and an ethic of love. An ethic of privilege would say, I am chosen, I am special, I follow God, God broke my chains, see y'all later. And an ethic of love says, wow, God did a miracle. Who all is this miracle for? God loves me, but God loves the jailer. God loves the other prisoners. What can I do in this moment to make sure they know that love? I'm not better than anyone. God doesn't love me more. God loves us all. And I am called as a bearer of this good news to find out where the love needs to shine through in this space. And so they stay. And as a result, the jailer and his family are baptized. And they hear and receive the good news, and they see the freedom that is available to them, too. I didn't read any further. The story goes on. And what happens is um, they, they stay at the jailer's house because they're still in prison. They don't leave. And word comes from the officials that they can go free. And Paul and Silas say, nuh-uh, no. 
first of all, we were Roman citizens, and you did not give us due process, and now you have to deal with that. You have to deal with the fact that you, you broke the rules here. This is a corrupt system. They, they use their freedom to take a swipe at an unjust system, to use their privilege that they did have, Roman citizenship, to call out power. And that's, that's the, all the only way true change happens, is if the powerful use their power to change things, and the powerless get some power. And that's what's happened here. They took a risk going to prison. They lost some freedom, but they were bound so that others might be free. They let go of that privilege. They didn't insist on being Roman citizens from the beginning. They did it on their way out the door. That was the risk they took, but their gain is a real faith. A faith that sings in prison. A faith that shakes the foundations of the earth. A faith that sets others free and saves lives. That's a real faith. It's a real faith. Who will I hurt if I act for my own good? That is the question that's been haunting me this week. It's been haunting me as I have approached this passage, and it has been haunting me as I have watched the world. A world that does not seem to be asking that question. Who will I hurt if I act for my own good? Instead, it is a world that is asking this question. How can the world serve me and my worldview? You know, I always like to take scripture and apply it to the things that are going on around us. And I had a a profound lunch with an area educator That made me think I was going to take this passage and apply it to the state of education in our culture. And particularly to look at teachers and all that they're having to bear right now. They can't teach. Because so many people are insisting my worldview is the best and you'll teach nothing but my worldview. And so their hands are tied. They are bound and need to be set free. And that's what I... That's what I was going to do. And then all the stuff about this Southern Baptist Convention dropped and got hot in the news again. And I was like, oh, look at the abuse. People using their power to take advantage of other people. And then protecting their reputation and their money at the cost of others. Binding more people up so that they might be free. And then there was another shooting in Texas. Another shooting. More children and more teachers. And we stand around fighting about how to keep our money safe privilege safe and our rights safe and people are dying it's not easy for me to talk about these things it's not easy for y'all to hear about these things but these things all three of them have two things in common they all come from a position of privilege It is all coming from this space of why, how can the world serve me and my worldview? Someone thinks their perspective is better than someone else's and they're willing to stand on the backs of people to make it happen. They are willing to abuse others to protect it. They are willing to kill for their own glory, to protect their worldview. And the other thing that these all three share is they're all three linked to Christianity. 
In all three cases, people are using a theology to back up that worldview. And that's, that's the complicated thing about this faith. That's the complicated thing about this Bible. I tell people all the time, you can use the Bible to justify anything. What you have to do is read it in community with one another and ask each other this question, who will I hurt if I act for my own good? How can I love more fully? What can this tell me about how we love? That is supposed to be what this drives us to. And instead, too many people are using it to say, I'm going to use this to preserve my privilege, to preserve my power, to keep me and my worldview safe. We're supposed to be the people of the good news. But how often are we turning on bad news and hearing it tied to the church? And I know this breaks y'all's heart. Because when I sit down and have those four questions conversations with you, so many of you say, I just can't take it anymore. I don't want to be this people of hate. I want to be this people of love. Isn't that who we're supposed to be? This people of love. So I stand before you today and say, yeah. Yes. That is who we are. We are the people of love. We have a faith that sings from prison. We have a faith that sets aside power to stand with the vulnerable. We are a people of an ethic of love, not privilege. Jesus, who went to the cross, put aside all the power. To stand with the vulnerable. And set us free. And this is who this church is trying to be. I heard a, a commentator talk about the exhausted middle. Y'all feel like the exhausted middle right now? Like, like, just, we've got these poles on either side, and there's all of us standing in the middle going, hey, 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 can we not listen to each other? Can we not work together? Can we not find a way forward? Can we not find some peace in the midst of that? And that's what I find us to be. That's what I find this church to be. I find us to stand with those teachers that feel like they're lost by developing these school partnerships, by walking alongside them. I find us to be this people in the signs we have around this church that say we stand for peace and we welcome all. We stand for peace and we welcome all. And that means we listen and we hear and we don't take a privilege of perspective. We take an ethic of love. And we can't take it anymore. We have to do something. We're finally sick of just having people talk around us. We're going to set them free. We're going to cast out the demons. Here we go. And that may mean that we're locked up a little bit. But we're going to sing from prison. We're going to sing from prison. So don't just let the words, especially the words that preserve power, hang in the air. Use our power. We have power, y'all. We have the power of Jesus Christ. We have the power of love. There is nothing stronger on this earth. We're going to use that power to set others free. We're going to challenge the system, and we're going to sing out from prison. And that, my friends, is a real faith. That's a real faith. That's a faith that sets others free. That's a faith that saves lives. That's a faith that shakes the foundations of the earth. And it is all good news. It is all good news. And it is worth singing about. Praise the Lord. Amen. I wanted to leave. I wanted to walk off. But it's time for our offering. <laughs> Y'all, um, as some ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offering, 
I want to lift up again. We really are doing the stuff that changes people's lives. I want to talk about the ministry innovation grants. Remember those from way back? Two of them have, have already done transformative work. One, we have gotten televisions for the prisons. You want to talk about singing from prison? They're going to sing from prison so that jail ministers can share the good news with the people who are bound up. There's no better way to honor this passage that day than like that, except we also have this counselor's closet over at Artie Baker. And our little $1,000 has turned into the loaves and the fishes, y'all. Our little $1,000 inspired Samaritan's Feet to give 180 pairs of shoes to that closet. And we're storing those clues. That's right. We're storing those shoes because they're not just going to Artie Baker. They're going to elementary schools all across the, the city. And our gift that started the closet inspired other nonprofits to give. And now there are more closets. That's what this space does. Let us pray. Lord, we call upon your power and presence to make these gifts that we give set others free. Amen.